Continuing on with our series of educational forums on our soil, our health, our produce, our farms, joining us this hour is Mark Shepard, who is trained in both mechanical engineering and ecology. His Acres USA 2013 release, Restoration Agriculture, Real-World Permaculture for Farmers, is a fantastic journey through his life experience and guidance for creating sustainable perennial agriculture worldwide and in our own backyards. Also, it is worth mentioning that I learned something quite fascinating from just reading the back jacket of his book, that human cultures have only relied upon annual plant seeds as a staple food crop for 10,000 years. I'd never really thought about it. But from my own writing on the white spirit animals, whose legacies are from that time period especially, we are talking about since the ending of the last ice age, and that every single human society that has relied on annual crops as staple foods has collapsed. But as Shepard demonstrates, at his 160-106-acre commercial-scale perennial agriculture ecosystem farm, you can create systems that imitate nature in form and function through cultivating and supporting natural perennial ecosystems such as hazelnut, gooseberry, raspberry bushes, grapes, apple trees, etc. Restoration Agriculture, the title of his Acres USA 2013 release, Real World Permaculture for Farmers is superb in all ways, and I hope you'll stay with us this hour to learn how you, too, can be part of this positive change. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Well, thank you, Zoe, for having me. You did such a good job with the introduction. Uh, I don't know if I'm even necessary here. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Well, if I knew as much as you knew, I wouldn't be necessary. Um, you know, there's, it's one of the, uh, the, the book is extraordinary. I, I have read thousands and thousands of books, and so when I come across one that is, oh my gosh, somebody could take this book and really learn how to do what you're talking about and see that it's doable, what a perfect inspiration. So let's start where I did with this 10,000 years ago when the waters were plenty and the green was abundant, and we moved into this notion of single seed agriculture. How did that happen? Uh, actually, archaeologists are really arguing over that right now. Uh, on on what the real cause was, but if you think about it, uh, the glaciers had melted. Most of the big flush of you know rainwaters or meltwater that had been happening through you know maybe a couple hundred years, couple thousand years, was mostly over. So there was a global warming, a global drying. Uh, it was also coincident with the extinction of most of the uh, uh, mega uh, the megafauna, the Pleistocene megafauna. And somehow, all around the globe, at about the same time, people started to settle down. And, and what the archaeologists fight over is, was it, was it uh, people who had, um, like, armed uh, military skills that got people to settle down? Or was it religion that got them to settle down? They haven't quite figured that out, what the real cause is. I think it's just a whole suite of circumstances where that... Uh, at some point in time, people did settle down, started living in villages and cities instead of uh, as roving family groups going from abundance to abundance. When we talk about permaculture, not everybody will know what that means. So because that's sort of the foundation of where we're going from tonight, talk to us a bit about its history and what it is. Well, the, the term permaculture was coined by an Australian gentleman named Bill Mollison, uh, back in the late 70s into the 80s, and it uh, originally meant it was a contraction between the two words uh, permanent, which most people know what permanent means, it's here forever, and agriculture, which is how we produce our, our foodstuffs, our staple food crops. And uh, so permaculture meant somehow designing some sort of human agriculture that was permanent. And if you look at how we grow most of our staple foods today, corn, beans, rice, wheat, uh, lentils, and etc., we have to destroy an ecosystem, whether it's a prairie or a forest, plow up the ground or use herbicide to kill any of the plants that are there, and then scatter the seeds of our food crops. Uh, once upon a time at the village scale, that wasn't all that uh, detrimental to the, to the whole you know, Earth's ecology, uh, because if we degraded a place too much, we would just move on and things would grow back. And it would uh, the natural forces of succession would replenish the soil and nutrients, etc. Well, once human beings have colonized the whole entire planet and our annual agriculture takes up to almost uh, 50% of the Earth's surface, that means 50% of the Earth's surface is not a three-dimensional functional ecosystem. 
it's basically a desert uh, for half the year. There's nothing there, and then just a, a few brief months, there's a little green crop on it that's you know 100% used for uh, our consumption one way or the other. And and as you point out in your first chapter of restoration agriculture, you have a perennial agriculture vision, and you've implemented it. And I have to tell you, it's it's so simple as to be absolutely stunningly brilliant. Um, trees, shrubs, vines, perennial plants, fungi, when they're all put together. So when you converted this farm, and I know in, I guess it was around 19, the early 1990s that you were certified in permaculture. Describe to us the thinking that you had and what you were looking for, and then how you started to think about the model, because it made me think about my own backyard garden and how I'm really tired of this annual <laughs> tear up. The, I am. I've done done this for almost 20 some years, 25 years, and more recently, fairly larger scale. And just this year, I said, I'm not doing it next year. So now I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to go plant berry bushes <laughs> and grapes and whatnot. Talk to us about the vision and then how you got from A to Z. Well, kind of how, how we got around to the farm scale side of things is I had taken a permaculture design course and it started teaching like individual segments at permaculture design courses, was reading the literature, and the buzz at the time was that, well, with permaculture, we'll grow all of our food in, all, in our front yards and we won't need farms anymore. Right. And that was always said as we sat down to a bowl of beans and rice or some other sort of, uh, you know, staple food uh, that was grown on an annual plant. And when I started to bring that to people's attention, people became uncomfortable. It's like, mm-hmm. well, yeah, but it's organic. It's fine. It's like, well... Yes, it's organic. You don't use the toxic petrochemical sprays, but you're still destroying an ecosystem to plant annual crops that only grow for three or four months and then die, then you harvest their seeds, and you do it all over again. Work, 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 work. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the idea was to establish a staple food crops farm uh, where if you look at, like, the population of Chicago or New York, we can have every, every single roof in that town and every vacant lot green with some sort of food stuff and it won't supply enough carbohydrates, proteins, and oils to feed the people who are there. It won't provide the staple foods that they need to survive. So what, what we needed, I argued for uh, at a couple permaculture courses, was that we need large farm-scale operations that are ecological farms that produce the staple foods. And um, it led to the purchase of a farm in southwest Wisconsin through a long, elaborate, colorful story and when we got there, uh, by that time, we kind of figured out the strategy we were going to employ, and that was to imitate the, uh, um, the structure and function of the historic uh, ecosystem, of that particular plant community, um, suite of plants that live together, and focus on the ones that can supply us with our staple foods. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you do this in each environment or each biome. So here in Maryland, it would be different than you or it might be in Arkansas. And so once you identified that, you talked about, like like it's here, it would be we would look at our forest canopy and then we'd look at the understory and then we'd look at the forest floor as an example. Um, What are the kinds of foods that you plant? Because you also have... um, other animals and, and things that are all integrated into one enormous, beautiful system. Yeah, we'll see. What, like, like you said, wherever you go, you figure out what are the local plant communities. You know, in, in Maryland, uh, the oak savanna model is one type because there were blowdowns where a hurricane would come through and knock over and open a section of forest that would grow up with grassland. So mm-hmm. it would go through the prairie phase and shrubs and bushes and vines and the sun-loving trees such as oak and chestnut would get established. Oftentimes those openings were kept, were kept open by Native Americans with uh, using fire uh, in order to keep these nut-producing trees. And then you have fresh green grass growing for you know, deer and other grazing animals to come through so you'd have plenty of hunting available. So in one sense we're imitating that and that we would take uh, – our suite of species, instead of oak, I picked chestnuts, they're cousins, they're all fagaceae, oak, chestnut, and beech, and we have apples and cherries, uh, obviously pears, and then hazelnut is a dominant shrub, uh, we have some pine nuts as a pine component, and then the whole entire farm has a grassy cover on it, so then we use the animals to manage the system. We use cattle to obviously graze the grass, they fertilize the ground, um, they also eat um, 
uh, fallen leaves from trees that may carry disease. After we go through and harvest an area, we'll move pigs through, and they'll eat any fruit or nuts that have fallen to the ground or that we throw to the ground that have pests in them. So they help to short-circuit the pest uh, cycles. So by treating our farm not as a uh, discrete set of crops, but as an ecosystem, we manage it as a whole, uh, it acts more like an ecosystem, and pests and diseases are more in balance. We have all the pests and diseases you can imagine, but they're not catastrophically damaging to, to any particular crop. Yeah, and I like the way you said that. You know, it, at some point, as you write in your book, Restoration Agriculture, things find a balance. You know, at some point, the black walnut will probably get a blight, but that's what happens over time. I mean, and and that forests, you know, it used to be, as you pointed out, the natives would burn certain areas for regeneration, and we don't do that. And then these massive forest fires come in because we haven't done any management properly. Great. Um, yeah, you wonder why, you know. Well, that's a really good question. So, well, the, the, because at one point in time, you know, people approached, and, and still do to the most part, approach uh, the land and gardening or farming with concepts instead of observing reality to see what reality is. Exactly. And, and one of the great ones is, is what we were talking about with these forest fires. When Europeans first got to most of the uh, Intermountain Great Basin, all up and down the, the, west, uh, the west coast, most of the gigantic trees from Ponderosa Pine and Douglas Fir and Redwoods all, uh, all lived in these open parklands with grass underneath. That was maintained by regular fires, mm-hmm. so looking at, at the trees and saying, wow, there's this beautiful forest here. We need more trees. Stop this fire because it's preventing more trees from growing. So instead of observing the system to see how it actually works, we approach the system with our ideas of how we thought it should work. And when nature did what nature does, it conflicted with our concept. And so then we're stuck fighting against it. The same is true in an apple orchard. If you plant nothing but apples, you're going to get apple pests and diseases. Well, then when nature does what nature does and sends apple and pest diseases your way, we fight against it with sprays and all kinds of stuff. Instead of looking at how does nature work, how can I interact with the system and manage the whole overall health of the system and yield some picture-perfect, beautiful, um, healthy, nutritious food. Exactly. One one of the things um, we've talked about a lot on the show, and maybe we'll talk about it again this hour, but maybe not, are GMOs and this horrible thing of warfare defoliants and insertions in Roundup Ready soybeans, et cetera. And now that I've said that, I do want you to say something to that point. Joe Salatin was with us earlier, and we talked a bit about it. I guess I know whose team you're on. (laughs) Yours. Thank God I'm on yours. (laughs) So from your vantage point, what is the problem with this? Well, other than the fact that it's extraordinarily toxic, uh, you know, like deadly toxic, carcinogenic and all that kind of stuff, and when we're, when we're inserting genes across species, things that have never been there before, like arrowhead flounder in a, in a tomato and so on, uh, we have no idea of the long-term downstream through time consequences, for one. Well, then on the other, it doesn't really pay. I just last week... Um, I read some the latest USDA figures, and I, I don't remember the numbers exactly. I apologize. Somebody can look it up. But it was like the cost of production for a bushel of corn was like $4.80 per bushel. It's what it costs a farmer to grow corn. Selling price was like three and a quarter. Mm. Mm. So that means for every bushel of corn that they're growing, this farmer is losing, you know, a buck fifty plus per bushel. That's times 200. They're losing 200, 300 bucks an acre. Wow. Wow. Um, and so, of course, the federal government has to come and, and come up with creative names. This is actually a crop insurance program. It's not a, you know, it's not a subsidy. Well, for crying out loud, it's a subsidy. Right. Um, it doesn't work economically on the ground. It doesn't work ecologically because we have to destroy a perennial ecosystem. And it doesn't work economically for the farmer. So why are we even doing it at all? Right. One, way, one reason why we're doing it is farmers are stuck there. And if you just look at your own personal household economy, mm-hmm. if you bought a home, you are stuck with those payments until you either pay it off or sell your place and retire the debt through revenues of sales. Well, if, if your house went down and you're underwater, you can't sell that at a profit and you still owe money. You're, 
you know, the farmer is in the same situation as a homeowner underwater is, how do you get out? Mm-hmm. So that's part of the tricks of, of what I do is to help people to look at the economics differently and then how to start farming it differently in order to uh, not bury yourself financially. Yeah, well, it's it's beautifully done, and I'm just so grateful that Acres USA has published Restoration Agriculture, Real World Permacultural for Farmers. You can learn more at www.restorationag.com and also forestag.com, and we'll be right back with our guest, Mark Shepard. This is Ken Roseboro, editor of the Organic and Non-GMO Report at www.nongmoreport.com, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. This beautiful book, and you will really be able to take it home and think about what fruit bushes you're going to plant next year or what chestnut tree you're going to put in your backyard. So I want to come to back to permaculture for a moment because one of the beautiful things that you and others, Mark, have shown by creating your own farm that is solar powered, and you know, we'll talk about that, um, is that basically it's about taking some responsibility, asking ourselves the right questions, but permaculture has an ethical basis. And, and I'd like if you would take a moment to just sort of tease that out for us, because I think it's a really important foundation. Yeah, I, I, that's actually one of the things that attracts me to permaculture is that being based on an ethic, it's not like a cookie-cutter approach, do A, do B, do C, do D. It's based on a set of ethics, and whenever you have a discussion about ethics, it's exactly that. It's a discussion. A whole bunch of us have to sit around and, and, and figure out what this, this common uh, core set of values are. And in permaculture, there's like the big three. One is earth care. Is, uh, as human beings, we have a responsibility to take care of this planet. We don't take care of this planet, it's not going to take care of us, and, and we live that every single day. The second one is people care, is if we don't take care of people, you know, all of the people around us, they're going to get pretty ornery, and sometimes they can get violent, and that can cause problems within societies. The third one is one that uh, I think is the most <laughs> fascinating within permaculture circles. Uh, the third one has to do with uh, some sort of equitable uh, distribution exchange, a method, a way that we can uh, somehow fairly distribute goods and services while on one hand rewarding those who actually have risked and taken initiative and yet also on the other hand not, uh, not um, cutting people out because of, you know, for whatever disadvantage that they may have had, taking care of everybody somehow and yet one of the things that, that does not get talked about a lot in permaculture, I think, should, is that those who choose not to do anything and are actually true slackers, um, they should be disincentivized as well. So this third one, some people call it, you know, fair share. Uh, I like to say some sort of equitable distribution system for, for mm-hmm. ecologically produced surplus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and it's interesting because when you ask those questions, each individual has a role in it. And, and so it's participatory even at the consumer level, which is what I like so much about the focus you and others, you know, have, have brought to the discussion. And this notion of um, perennial landscaping makes so much sense as a um, sort of a nationwide agenda, when I hear people talk about planting trees, and I'm one of them who talks about it and tries to do it, and I bought a lot of land just to save 40 acres of trees, basically, um, and, and an old-growth forest that's contiguous for the deer, et cetera, um, how would that work, and how do you envision it? If if Because not everybody's going to have a farm, but there are things we could be doing in our cities and around the world that I think it was Corsica where you were that you show they have such a beautiful ecology. There's a, a number of different places where I've gone. It's just fascinating how people used to live once upon a time. I'd already mentioned Native Americans in, in USA here, but over in Europe, there you know there are European cultures for for where these villages have existed for thousands of years based on the produce from the nut trees. It was J. Russell Smith who wrote Once Upon a Time, uh, 1926, of uh, the book Tree Crops was published. 
He proposed to prevent soil erosion by planting an upper canopy of trees that would produce food for animals, you know, the seeds and nuts and fruits, and humans as well. And then we could grow our crops underneath it, you know, in an agroforestry type system. And uh, all around the world, those have been traditional uh, ways of um, living and growing. But once the whole modern age hit and the green revolution with chemical fertilizers and so on, the annual, annual grains took off as the king, you know, king corn, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so nowadays where we are is we can't go back to a little village style, you know, grow your, you know, fruitsy nutsies in the backyard. That won't be enough to feed us. You know, there's, there's enough people on the planet that I think that everywhere that human beings live, we should, any, any landscaping that we do, highwayscaping, cities, etc. Anything green that we put in the ground should be producing food. It makes total sense. Every single food, every single tree in the city or wherever you're living has food growing on it. Yeah, it makes total sense. You know, that's what I was saying when I was reading your book. I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. I don't, I have to admit, I didn't think of it. <laughs> right. one and, of the, those... and the thing is, it doesn't have to be monocultures like we think of as, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of almonds in the Central Valley of California. No, right. Whatever the the local native trees, the fruits and nuts and berries that grow in, in your area in, in Maryland or my area in Wisconsin or Alaska or wherever, we use, you know, in genetically improved varieties of whatever those trees and shrubs are. And if you ever look at the brush growing on the side of the road, nobody planted it, plowed it, does herbicide, fungicide, fertilizer, nobody does anything to it except maybe run into it with a car or a snow plow every once in a while, and it still keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. That's sustainable agriculture. So let's Let's imitate that, that form, imitate those species, and just let it do its thing and eat the yields from it. it it's, a, it's so simple, and it's so right on. It's, it's really, you've really affected me. I have to say <laughs> that. I mean, I've, I have been, you know, a big biodynamic farm supporter and ecological environmentalist and all good things that people associate with the quote-unquote left, but I'm actually a libertarian, actually registered. Um, and and uh, the thing that it strikes me so much about what you've done is that it's not a bunch of words. I mean, you've lived it, you've shown it. How long did it take you to convert this row crop, grain crop farm into what you now have? Well, actually, that what you, you just picked up on something that, that's very fascinating is of all of the permaculture teachers who are out there, uh, those who actually live the lifestyle and have actually done this for 20 years as their economic livelihood, you know, boil down to like less than a handful of people. I bet. I bet. And, and so where I come from is I'm not, it's not a whole bunch of book learning and not a bunch of stuff that I parroted I learned on YouTube or something like that. It's something that I've lived. And so I may not be eloquent, but I can at least share what I've done. So that's what's radically different about uh, what I have done and what I wrote about in that book. Now, how long did it take to convert it to perennials? That's, that's kind of asked from the annual agriculture perspective, and that's not well, how kind I Kind of like a world. lifestyle. No, more about I was thinking like I have a young niece who wants a farm, and I'm thinking she's got to read this book first. Um, and I'm thinking how long would she need before she could see, you know, hazelnuts and blueberries? and Because it has a life also of a human life cycle. Right. Right, so what we have to do is we have to understand uh, natural succession. And if mm -hmm. you take a, even a sidewalk, eventually it will get covered with lichens and mosses and grasses and other plants, and it goes through a process no matter where you live till eventually it gets to the dominant uh, vegetation type of your area. And in, in Maryland, uh, a lot of places, moisture sites will be a lot of uh, maple a lot of drier sites will have oak and hickory, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it'll eventually get there, but you have to go through succession along the way, and you start with annual crops. That's how we started. Is uh, We used to grow, I even used to grow, believe it or not, corn and beans. Mm -hmm. Corn and beans. Well, then using the agroforestry techniques, especially of alley cropping, where you plant a row of trees between your fields of annual crops, you're not getting any income from your trees or food from your trees, so you're growing your annuals while your trees mature. Right. And as some of the trees start to mature, you can do fewer annuals and fewer annuals and fewer annuals. And so now, uh, this year, actually, we only have uh, two acres of annual crops. And I, I do have two acres of produce crop that's a perennial, and that's asparagus. 
The mm-hmm. only reason why we have two acres of asparagus is because that's all that one person can pick in the course of a day. Um, and so we started with alley cropping, and as time went on, we could, we can do less and less and less of annuals in between. Well, there, you've answered the question. It's a beautiful design. And um, and your farm is in tar- is run by solar and wind-powered sources. And equipment, I understand you have some patents of um, equipment that uses biofuels that aren't taken from the human food chain. Explain to us what that means. Well, um, if you take corn, for example, and you turn it into ethanol, the calories that are represented in that ethanol that you burn in your car could have gone to feed a human being if you ate it in the form of corn chips, or it could have gone to feed uh, a cow, for example, for for meat. Um, That's taking calories from the human food chain. Well, when growing um, uh, oil crops, that are then pressed for oil that are sold to a potato chip company, for example, and the potato chip company uses the oil to fry potato chips. Mm -hmm. So it's now being used to cook human food, if you call potato chips food. Uh, Maybe they're certified organic uh, sweet potato chips. Uh, Well, then when they've they've finished using the oil, that comes back to the farmers, and there's a a friend of mine who uh, gets the oil back from... Uh, larger secondary sources, he, he dewaters it, filters it, and then can get it back to us as farmers. And we've, we've uh, converted um, our tractors to run on straight vegetable oil. That's fantastic. Not, not, converted, not converted to biodiesel, but on the vegetable oil. And right. The radical difference between that system there and somebody thinking, oh, I'm going I'm to put a grease car kit on my, you know, on my Volvo or whatever and get grease from the greasy spoon down the road, that's not a fuel system. That's like an opportunistic, um, nice to get five gallons of grease, you know, once every couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. How do we genuinely, really, for real, design a system where we uh, fuel ourselves from a genuine surplus and doesn't take calories away from people and doesn't degrade the, the land resource? And that's, a, that's an entire different design process. And I think that that's that's the beauty of your education as both an engineer and an ecologist is that you look at things from a very um, systems perspective, which is modeled not out of invention, but observation and then invention based on observation of nature. So I, I love the way you describe everything because you basically teach us how to farm in nature's image. <laughs> Which is actually interesting. You had said that I, I agree with you that both parts of my education are instrumental in how I approach the world. But how I approach the world is exactly why I failed to thrive as an engineer because they wanted me to design better, you know, door handles. Right. And I wanted to like make things. Right. And there wasn't, you know, at least at that time, there wasn't a major for making things. You know, invent cool stuff that has never been done before. That right. That wasn't a major. No, it's interesting because we're in, we're a similar age, um, as was our last guest, Joel Salatin, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're the elders. <laughs> uh, We've well, all walked. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna object. Throw down a little red flag there. I'm a pre geezer, okay? Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Look, we can still laugh and talk about it. <laughs> so you know, we're not there yet. We're sort of looking down the road, going, hmm. Well, until I get there over the next twenty, this is what I need to do to help our youngers. Um, right. You write that most of the mass of a plant is air. That was another thing I never thought about. Uh, most, of, most of the body of a plant, 99%, is carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen. And the plant gets carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen from the atmosphere. And, and you think about that, uh, if only 1% or less is actually some sort of mineral nutrient, that's probably what came from the soil is this mineral nutrient. Well, now what I want you to do is think about, uh, I don't know if, you, uh, no, Route 80 doesn't go through Maryland, but if you go through, go through any highway that's been blasted through the cliff, and you'll see trees growing right out of the rock. Yeah. Now you tell me, who dug the $40 hole for that $10 tree? Who did soil preparation for three years with cover crops and green manures and compost? Nobody. This little seed landed on a rock and somehow survived. Um, and did you know that if you're just talking about, like, the forest around you in Maryland there, no matter where you look, that forest can get everything that it needs right out of the air, provided that you don't cut it any, any sooner than 60 years, because it takes about that long for the, for the plant to, like, kind of get into a balance with the, the nutrient cycles 
uh, in the soil. Mm-hmm. And so if, if we're cutting at a faster rotation than 60 years, we will be depleting the soil. But if we go longer than 60 years, we don't need fertilizers. Nature takes care of that. That's, that's my whole point. It's mm-hmm. like when you, f- you think about this rock in the middle of Lake Superior, eventually, like I said, the mosses and the lichens and grasses, it turns into a forest. Where did the soil come from? The ecological, biological systems created the soil. Well, now we go into agriculture. We cut down the, we cut down the biological system. We plow up the ground. We expose it to oxygen. The sun irradiates it. The water washes it away, and soil gets depleted year after year after year after year. Nature creates rich, healthy, diverse soil. Agriculture destroys it. So we need to redesign our agriculture to follow the same rules that nature does and learn how to interact with it and not, uh, not degrade the resource base. Exactly. And, of course, that's, that's the whole issue worldwide in almost any domain we point to. Either we treat life with reverence in partnership or we continue to treat it like an exploitable commodity that is endless, which it's not, and we can all see the devastation it's creating worldwide. One of the things you obviously talk about, and I've also done some programming on, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, I want to talk about the importance of bees and how everybody in the audience can really make a difference. If you're just joining us, our guest is Mark Shepard. His book, Restoration Agriculture, Real World Permaculture for Farmers. If you, like me, have really wanted to be part of the positive transformation of our our planet and our local environment read this book uh, there are things you can do which I'm going to be doing I do have blueberry bushes and raspberry bushes but now they're going where some of my other annual seed foods went instead because they got the best sun so we're gonna have a little experiment on dogwood farm and I'll report in Hi, this is Ruth Berlin. I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Pesticide Network. We're a coalition of 25 organizations in the state concerned about the impact on pesticides on your health and our environment. Learn more about our work on our website at mdpestnet.org, M-D-P-E-S-T-N-E-T.org. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Mark Shepard is our guest. His recent 2013 Acres USA release, Restoration Agriculture, Real World Permaculture for Farmers. Learn more at www.restorationag.com and www.forestag.com. So, Mark, as a founder of Restoration Agriculture International and your new forest farm, which is a hundred six acre perennial agricultural savanna. I have read that it is considered by many to be one of the most ambitious sustainable agricultural projects in the United States. Um, And the vision is so, um, what's the right word? Simple. So how are, like, how do extension services and governments and counties, when they hear this, how wonderful this could be, how do they react? Uh, that's fascinating. I think a lot of how, how they react uh, depends on their own, you know, internal, you know, pre-programming through education and so on. Mm-hmm. There are some people that just immediately, right off the bat, immediately, you know, hate and despise what's going on. It's totally wrong, misguided, et cetera, et cetera. And other people, you know, other people say, wow, that's a pretty cool idea. There's a whole spectrum, you know, in between as well. And so what has happened is through time, as, as people have seen that, hey, you know, this is actually working, mm-hmm. um, they look at it. And when they realize that so many of the other farmers that they work with, that their systems aren't working, you know, they're, nowadays more than ever uh, extension folks and educators are looking for systems that work. And nature actually works. And what's fascinating about nature is nature has never spent a penny on any input whatsoever, and it's created the rich and abundant, you know, ecosystems that we inhabited and our, you know, our ancestors inhabited. So why not imitate that? It's a rather affordable way to to uh, create abundance. Yeah, not no question about elevate what already works, right. um, and integrate ourselves into the model rather than trying to make everything fit to our will, which is certainly not up to the creator's brilliance. Um, bees, I want to come back to bees. I've spent a lot of time um, you know, on this program with those who are really trying to solve the problem and make sure, like in Sweden, where they've planted bee highways of plants in all of their um, 
roadways that support the bee and butterfly migration, which I went. Now, that's a simple solution, too, just like yours. It really is. You know, creating habitat connectivity, no matter what the creatures are, is really, really helpful. And I find it fascinating you mentioned Sweden first and not North America, South America, because one of the things that I did want to bring up is when it comes to the pollinator conversation, uh, uh, so much even of what I think of like the good guys uh, are dogmatic adherence to little snap phrases instead of an actual thinking about what's going on here and what the bigger picture is, Mm -hmm. which is plastic. It's, It's how our whole education system works. It's all reductionist. You know, what's the one true thing that will make it work? Right, exactly. Here's a, here's a fascinating tidbit. Did you know that, that um, there are no colony nesting bees that are native to the Western Hemisphere? Honeybees aren't native to the Western Hemisphere. They don't belong here. This whole North and South America did just fine without them for Zelenia. No, I didn't know that. See, so, <laughs> you are my totally, teacher. They're totally unnecessary. However, <clears throat> pollinators are. And there's a whole host of of different insects that do the pollinating here, including types of bees. But the types of bees in the Western Hemisphere are not colony-forming bees. Mm -hmm. They do onesie-twosies, you know, here and there. They tunnel into holes in the wood or make holes in the mud and stuff like that. Uh, And they need habitat. So by eradicating a rich, diverse ecosystem to plant beans, for example, all of a sudden we have a a crop that now requires pollinating insects. We have no habitat for pollinators, so we bring in the honeybees. Same thing with almonds. Um, If we have a rich, diverse, three-dimensional ecosystem, uh, we will have habitat for pollinators and not necessarily the honeybees. The honeybees uh, could disappear on my farm, and it wouldn't matter. That's so fascinating. No, I did not know that. Um, and that changes the conversation a lot because that whole industrialization of beehiving and the plastic combs and replacing their own honey with corn syrup, which certainly doesn't right. help them at all, um, is just another example where we have exploited um, a creature on Earth as a product and destroyed even its natural way of being. And we've become dependent upon it. We've become dependent yeah. upon it for the foods that we get. So one little hiccup with the bees causes yeah. big troubles in our, in our agriculture because our agriculture isn't modeled after this particular ecosystem. We took a European agriculture and imported it to the USA, and it, it's not in context. It's, this, this it's so interesting there. because in California and Texas where they truck in all the bees – you know, into the fields because of these big swaths of hundreds of acres of monoculture of whatever it is. So in terms of then other pollinators, um, and you mentioned some of them, and the things that they need in terms of biomass, what would be some of those things? If somebody's in the listening audience, like I planted a lot of hyssop because it attracted all kinds of butterflies and bees. And bees, I don't even know what they are, but they sure look different (laughs) than things I've seen before. Um, What are some other things you can plant so that we can do that? That, that's basically the thing is, is to always strive to have some sort of things flowering in your system. And, you know, the, the, the various different prairie and meadow flower mixes are a perfect way to start. Well, also, if you think of, uh, you mentioned that monocrop, let's say almonds, for example, in California. Well, almonds are a prunus. They're, you know, one particular genus of tree. They're mm-hmm. related to cherries and peaches, et cetera. If you look at right where you guys are in Maryland, <clears throat> starting as soon as the leaves come out, there's going to be uh, different trees that flower different months, uh, easily halfway through the season. We have flowering trees in Wisconsin anyways, all the way up until sometimes 4th of July, a different sequence of flowering trees. And so by having a diversity of woody crops in our mm-hmm. system, we'll always have those there for the tree pollen and nectar. Well, then also for nesting sites, cracks and bark and uh, holes that woodpeckers uh, knock into trees are also nest sites for certain for certain wild pollinators, and and just uh, getting away from the monocrop uh, mindset um, at least to a certain extent. And let's take those almonds. What if we all of a sudden instead of having 100% almonds, what if we say 20% almonds, you know, 20% chestnut, 20% this, 20% that, and have a mix of trees? Automatically, your risk is lessened. Because if you have a catastrophic freeze when the almonds are blooming, Mm -hmm. you don't lose 100% of everything. You'll still have possibly peaches or you'll still have, you know, pears or whatever else is in there. 
Are, are you of the practice of pruning fruit trees and shrubs or letting them just sort of tangle and mangle and do their thing? Well, I'm kind of on a little bit of both. Uh, I grew up in apple country I was a mile and a half up the road from where Johnny Appleseed was born in Massachusetts. And my grandfather figure, it wasn't my biological grandfather, he was once upon a time a cider um, uh, apple orchardist. And what cider was back when he got started was an alcoholic beverage. Mm-hmm. And, and what they did was a minimal pruning. And he told me that you want to remove enough branches so that a, a blue jay can fly through and not hit its wings, but you don't want to remove so much that you could throw a cat through and it would, it would miss. Well, and that's so an easy you, way to remember. <laughs> as, long, if, as long as the blue jay is not a really big one the size of a cat. <laughs> so so if, you, if you do that, you're somewhere in the middle. What what pruning is good for, uh, you'll notice this with, with, with fruit especially, with, you know, with like soft fruit um, really especially, is that with an airflow through your trees, uh, the morning dew will evaporate more quickly and uh, fungal diseases will have less of an opportunity to, to uh, take hold. Mm-hmm. This year in Wisconsin, we've had a record wet summer. We've had at least an inch of rain every week, sometimes five or more inches a week. Wow. And, and uh, fungal diseases would be insane to control if we didn't have some pruning. Well, some of the pruning that I do is I let the cattle go in and they remove the lower branches up to about four or five feet. Mm-hmm. And then the other pruning that I do is I remove the branches that would uh, <laughs> poke me in the eye as I'm driving by with a tractor. Right. And that's it. Oh, interesting. Because I have heard, it's like even in my own garden, some beds I experimented with not pulling any weeds and just a little bit, but then the insects, the predators, went to the weeds instead of my crop, and that was great. I mean, it's just growing from ourselves, our family. It's not like I have a a big stand or I have a business, but I have experimented. And, And it's really true that if you do just a little, and even if it's just on your balcony or in your by your back kitchen door, ladies and gentlemen, if you have never grown something, do it. Even if it's going to the store and buying a store-bought tomato, put it in a container and grow it and grow your own tomatoes, and you will find a different kind of reverence and um, joyous appreciation for what we have, but also maybe perhaps a deeper concern for what we're losing. So we have just a few minutes left, Mark, and there's so many things you're so versed in we haven't touched on. Give us your big picture of where we're going um, and the things that concern you that perhaps all of us can make a difference about. Well, the the big picture of where we're going, and it actually is happening and increasing uh, in speed planet-wide, where we're going is we are uh, making a small change from uh, an annual crops, destroy an ecosystem to plant a few hard seeds for our sustenance, to a more perennialized integrated uh, ecosystem type farming, more ecological farming. Uh, That's happening worldwide, uh, and it's actually happening mostly with um, smaller scale farmers first, Mm -hmm. and then the larger larger operators are following along because they realize that long term it makes sense to be having a perennialized system because you don't have to have all these current annual expenses occur over and over and over again. And just the labor, by God, and the expense of the labor if you have to hire labor. And, and what I what I see is is making just one small change, and wherever you live on planet Earth, let's take the annual cropland in that area and make one small change and convert it back towards a mimic of the natural systems that were there when Europeans first got here. Mm-hmm. It'll still be producing our annual crops in, in our in our fields for us, and it will be producing these perennial crops: uh, trees, shrubs, bushes, vines, fungus, animals. Uh, along with it, the system will come into more balance. We're taking carbon out of the air, building soil, cleaning up the groundwater. Uh, one small change. Let's turn our annual crop fields gradually back into a mimic of the ecosystems that they were. That's beautifully stated. Now, if it should be so easy for it to happen, may it. You know, you never know, and I think that's the beautiful thing, and I want to thank Acres USA for publishing your book because I've read a lot of books, as I said, and I've been on this beat a very long time, and there is nothing, truly nothing, like your book in the market. Yay, good. <laughs> no, it's, it's very true. You know, it's, it's one thing to have 
knowledge from studying or going to people's farms and learning. Like I'm an interviewer, so I've learned a great deal in so many fields. But when you listen to somebody who has lived what they've written about, it's a totally different kind of um, teaching. Good. I'm glad you noticed that. And one of the things that I find fascinating, back to the big picture, if, if one family can do this yeah. in 15 years, uh, that means that if every one family does this in 15 years, we can completely revegetate the planet in 15 years at a profit. Mm-hmm. And that's a true story. And well, it's, it's challenged it's all just... of us to start thinking about how do we do that. And now let's, let's, let's get to work. Well, I want to thank you again and encourage our audience to follow up with you, firstly, by buying a copy of your wonderful book, Restoration Agriculture, Real World Permaculture for Farmers. It's an Acres USA 2013 release. Online, www.restorationag.com and www.forestag.com. And one more thank you to Fred Walters and everybody at acresusa.com. And God bless you, Mark. May your garden and your farm flourish. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Kortner. Our engineer is Noah Dankner. I'm Dr. Zohar Hieronymus, and we hope you enjoyed the show.